The sermon this morning begins and ends, is bookmarked with the same words, a short poem by the great American poet Wendell Berry. I'm going to read it at the beginning. At the end of the service, um, we will read it all together. It's a poem that is a favorite of many Unitarian Universalists, such a favorite that it warranted inclusion in our hymnal. It goes like this. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not task, tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I rest in the grace of the world and am free. It's a beautiful piece of poetry, isn't it? How many have heard it before, the, the Wendell Berry? It's a poem uh, that says something, something profound, I think, about the nature of grace. Um, but, but let me tell you, I, I've been hearing that, that poem read in UU churches since I was a child. And, and as with things that become familiar, uh, familiarity sometimes breeds the... Um, ability to tease a little bit, and, and one day I decided that I was going to, um, to write a joke about this poem. It didn't wind up being a particularly funny joke, um, but the joke went that I had actually discovered Wendell Berry's first draft of, of this poem. Um, and, and Wendell Berry, when, when he writes his drafts, uh, he doesn't have all of that, that flowery prose. He really just kind of writes very sort of simply the, the idea or the concept. And, and his draft of the poem went, I'm upset, I can't sleep, has anyone seen my duck? <laughs> but the poem actually says something about the nature of grace, that, that contrast between mortal fear, existential worry, and something as random and beyond our control, as a blue heron or a wood drake, implies something about the workings of grace, namely that it is a force beyond our control. Grace, we might say, if we were to try to define it, is a religious or spiritual word for goodness that comes to us unmerited and unearned, blessing beyond our control, in this sense, we might think of grace as a kind of cosmic luck. There is something true in this understanding of the word. It is undeniable that there is good that comes to us that has absolutely nothing to do with how good or deserving we may be. Jane Kenyon, in her poem Otherwise, observes the essence of this truth. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. It might have been otherwise, right? Go back in time. Go back to earlier in your life, yesterday or the day before that. Go back years or decades to young adulthood or adolescence or childhood. Go back to even before your birth. Go back to all that might have been different, all that might have been otherwise. Luck, which we did nothing to deserve, which we neither earned nor merited, is the great truth. Walt Whitman, a poet who I also love, boasts in his song of the open road, afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose, 
I ask not good fortune, I myself am good fortune. With all due respect to Whitman, he better ask for good fortune. It's all around him. Healthy, free, traveling wherever I choose. That's grace. His road might have been otherwise. There's a phrase I sometimes turn to to express this sense of cosmic luck that I encounter in my day-to-day life, this halting awareness that it may have been otherwise. It's a phrase that comes to mind when I walk through the walls of a hospital and pass by people whose lives are filled with much more suffering than mine is right now. When I pass by the person on the street with dirty clothes and a weathered face, when I read the story in the news about the devastation of a natural disaster or of a refugee camp in a war-torn region, the phrase that comes to mind is whispered under my breath is, there but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God go I. Ever, Ever said that to yourself? For religious liberals, understanding grace in these terms may be theologically problematic, though. After all, the idea that God has a plan that involves some being chosen to have a good life and many being chosen to have a miserable life is a repulsive idea. It's a vision of God that we shrink from. And it's also, when we say that, there but for the grace of God go I, else is also a cop-out After all, some significant portion of human suffering is not due to chance in any meaningful way. For every person who suffers due to a natural disaster or a freak accident or an arbitrary malady, there are many, hundreds, thousands, who suffer due to systems of violence, oppression, poverty, and war, systems that have both a human design and also a human solution. There but for the grace of God go I. In many cases, it would be more accurate to say, there because of human meanness goes him. There because of human indifference goes her. But even if we reject the notion that God chooses to bless some with favor while cursing others with unimaginable hardship, even if we insist that much much misfortune has a human rather than a divine fingerprint, it would still be impossible to deny that random fortune or dumb luck plays some role in making our lives what they are rather than otherwise. I remember having lunch with a dear friend of mine. A friend is a Christian minister. Uh, He serves a United Church of Christ congregation. And so we were having lunch and... um, and when, when we do lunch, we kind of get into talking theology. And, and I asked my friend to tell me about what grace means to him, about his understanding of grace. And my Christian minister friend said something very smart. He said, and I quote, Our theology of grace is inversely proportional to our theological anthropology. That's, that's my message for you this morning. <laughs> Go, go and do likewise. No, um, <laughs> see, this is, this is where we're kind of nerds when we go out to talk. But to translate and unpack that statement, what my friend was saying, what my friend was saying was that to the extent that we have a positive view of human nature and of human potential, to the extent that we have a high estimation of ourselves, we won't tend to think of ourselves as in need of grace. However, if we have a negative view of human nature and low expectations of human potential, we will see grace everywhere. It will all be grace. It's like if we think that we're really, really good and competent, then we don't need the intervention of luck. I did it all myself. But if we think that we're pretty, you know, pretty lousy, then then it's it's all luck. So where do Unitarian Universalists tend to fall on this spectrum of holding human nature in either high or low esteem? 
on the, on the high esteem side, right? Let me give you a hint. When, when we include the hymn Amazing Grace in our hymnal, and we're going to sing this at the end of the service, we give each other the option of substituting the word soul for the word wretch. We, we say, oh, okay, we're going we're gonna to... We're, it, gives, it gives you permission to rewrite the hymn to make ourselves seem better than the hymn writer thought that we were. <laughs> That's not an accident, by the way. Our tradition historically has had about as high a view as human nature as is possible to have. We've tended to regard ourselves and one another as capable and competent and good. And even more than that, we have embraced the work of justice, which to us means the work of refashioning a world in which the random accident of being born one race or one gender or one nationality or one socioeconomic class does not and should not foreclose a life of opportunity or security or happiness. According to my friend, such a hopeful theology does not leave a lot of room for grace. Belief, that belief in our radical self-sufficiency can close us off from having a sense of grace. In fact, it's uh, what Whitman said when he said, I am good fortune. Author Marilyn Robinson writes, it is Jesus' consistent teaching that the comfortable, the confident, and the pious stand in special need of the intervention of grace. The problem is that we don't recognize pride or hubris in ourselves any more than Oedipus did, any more than Job's so-called comforters. It can be so innocuous seeming a thing as confidence that one is right, is competent, is clear-sighted, or confidence that one is pious or pure in one's motives. And so I wonder, is there a way to keep our mostly hopeful view of humanity? our mostly hopeful view of humanity, which I don't want to do away with, and still make room for something like grace. I, I struck a chord here, all right. It's, um... So I want, to, I want to describe two ways in which human beings are said to embody grace. The first way is to be graceful. Graceful. We're particularly used to using the word graceful to describe accomplishments in the fields of art and athletics. Dancers, gymnasts, figure skaters, graceful, right? If our minister emeritus Charlie Cast were to stand up here and talk about grace, he might mention the grace of a second baseman's pivot to turn a double play. Grace is making something very difficult look smooth and effortless, but on some words, the, the, the term for that is misleading because that's not really grace, is it? The flips and the spins and the flashy glove work isn't the result of luck, but rather the result of years of dedicated effort and discipline and practice, merited and earned. Back in November um, in, in football, I'm kind of a sports fan, um, there was a, a rookie wide receiver for the New York Giants um, who made a catch on the evening football game um, that immediately everybody said was the greatest catch ever in the history of football. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. A rookie named, named, named Odell Beckham. And, and people said this is the greatest, the greatest catch ever. And he had, it was like a 50-yard pass, and he had, had jumped, and it was a falling back, and he was you know, several feet off the ground and completely horizontal and reaches over his head without even looking and catches the football you know, by the fingertips. And then it came out um, the, kind of the, within a few days later that this wasn't entirely luck that at practice, somebody found footage of him, and at practice, he practices catches just like this, kind of catches where he doesn't look and catches the ball with one hand over his shoulder. That's uh, amazing, isn't it? There is another word, though, not graceful, that's used to describe human beings who are said to embody grace. The word's not graceful, but gracious. 
And it's a word that is almost exclusively used to describe human beings. Graciousness is an interpersonal quality. It is the passing of grace between people. If you are feeling awkward or unsure, a gracious host can set you at ease. If someone has hurt you, you can graciously accept their apology, just as you can graciously apologize for having hurt someone. Graciousness involves having the capacity for compassion, courtesy, kindness, and mercy. Have you ever done something that makes you feel awkward or embarrassed only to have someone say something or do something that puts you at ease? Grace, graciousness. Have you ever put your foot in your mouth and then had someone forgive your insensitivity? Have you ever messed up in such a way that your relationship with someone else became estranged only to have that other person graciously forgive you rather than cut you off? We can recognize the grace that comes from graciousness. How do the workings of grace play out in your life? I find grace experience, grace in the receiving of love. When it comes right down to it, if I'm completely honest with myself, the love that I receive is not something I can really say that I've earned, deserved, or merited. And if I continue to receive it in the future, it won't necessarily be something that I've earned. Our positive theological anthropology, our positive view of human nature, does not guarantee that we will never be wretched. It doesn't guarantee that our fate in life will be determined by an accounting of our credits and debts, our rising up and our sinking down. No, our positive anthropology insists that our own wretchedness isn't the final word, the end of the story, or our eternal fate. Grace is many things, and one of the things that it is is graciousness the ability to redeem and bless each other. As Unitarian Universalists, we are the inheritors of a twin theological tradition. The Universalists, they spoke of an all-loving God ever bestowing the great gift of grace. And the Unitarians spoke of a humanity worthy of love and still worthy of love despite evidence that may be produced to the contrary. As the great theological bluegrass band Mumford & Sons puts it, It seems that all my bridges have been burnt, but you say that's exactly how this grace thing works. It's not the long walk home that will change this heart, but the welcome I receive at every start. These lyrics are about the the biblical story of the prodigal son, about the welcome, the gracious welcome received. It's not about the the walk home. It's not about crawling on your knees or the proving of yourself worthy, but it is the gracious welcome, the grace bestowed not by luck and not for merit, the grace of graciousness. So may we be both the receivers of grace and the givers of graciousness, and in the words of Wendell Berry, may we be held in the grace of the world, and freed. Won't you respond by joining with me in our spoken response, number 483, Wendell Berry. And if I can find it here. Join with me in saying, when despair for the world grows in me, And I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water And I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. 
For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free.